Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, welcome to the 2019 Summer Royal Candidates Climate Forum. Um, this is a packed room. I'm really excited to see you guys. I, I have to say we've, we've done a number of events um, here with the Climate Coalition of Somerville, and this is probably the least hard we've worked to get the word out about an event, and yet it's probably the most crowded event, and I, I think that speaks to the importance of the issue, um, and I'm, I'm excited because I, I didn't have to work quite as hard. Um, the, first, I want to point out that we do have interpretation uh, available. Um, in Spanish is Angie over here, so uh, come talk to her, if, um, or uh, in Portuguese as well. Um, and I believe we have a Haitian Creole interpreter coming. Um, let's see, what else? I have, a, I have some more housekeeping, uh, sorry about that. So uh, my name is Larry Yu. I, I want to give a, a big shout out to uh, Renee Scott and Stephen Moore who are, who are over here. Uh, they're the real animating force behind this event. I'm just the empty suit uh, standing before you. So we are the Climate Coalition of Somerville, uh, a group of organizations committed to addressing the climate crisis. Um, and I can tell that you all ha share our concern about the climate crisis. Uh, this event is being recorded, uh, so you should be aware of that on video. Uh, we are going to make the video available uh, online, and we're also going to produce a summary report uh, online for anyone to... Um, to access. Um, there is a sign-up sheet at the table over there if you'd like to get notified by email about, uh, about the summary report when it's available. Uh, we are not making an endorsement. I just want to stress that right now. Some thank yous uh, first to the Visiting Nurses Association for hosting and to the Welcome Project for arranging for interpretation. Those are two important ones. Uh, thanks to Rick Widmer for, for filming, and uh, the Summer World Media Center will be involved in editing the video to, uh, to make public. It's okay. You can. Um, and also thank you to the Mystic Activity Center, the Somerville Community Growing Center, and Vika Zafrin for providing some extra chairs. Uh, <laughs> um, and also thank you to, uh, to all the other uh, members of the Climate Coalition of Somerville. We just had an event two weeks ago, which uh, took a lot of effort, and yet uh, so many of you showed up today, this morning, to help set up, and hopefully are going to stay to help us break down. Uh, so thank you guys. Um, last thing, uh, we're going to buy some carbon offsets for this event. Uh, the major piece would be transportation. So if you could raise your hand if you drove here in a car. Um, if you could if, keep your hand up, please. Um, if you, yeah, that's right. This is the shaving part. If you could, if you could lower your hand if you drove in a battery electric car powered by renewable energy. Actually, if you could stand up. Oh my goodness. If that was the case. No. Okay. Um, and uh, and lastly, if you rode in a car with somebody else, then uh, make eye contact and make sure only one of you has your hand still raised. <laughs> Wow, okay. That is a small list. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, that's really helpful. Uh, so now, uh, I just want to introduce Julia Taliesin, the multimedia editor from the Somerville Journal, who will be our moderator for this morning. Hello, everybody. Uh, as he said, my name is Julia Taliesin. I'm the journalist for the Somerville Journal. Um, I'm going to start off just by introducing the candidates you see before you. I know many of you are probably familiar with them, but just in case. So right here, hi, Will. This is Willem Ba. He's a counselor at large. JT Scott, counselor from Ward 2. Ben Ewan Campin, counselor from Ward 3. Stephanie Hirsch, counselor at large. Kristen Stretzo, a candidate for counselor at large on the, in the November 5th election. Lance Davis, counselor from Ward 6. Jack Connolly, Jr., candidate for re-election for counselor at large. Bill White, counselor at large. And Katiana Ballantyne, Madam President, as we all know her. And city, so city council president and counselor from Ward 7. All right, so how this is going to go, first we're going to start off with one overarching question that each candidate is going to have 90 seconds to answer. Um, and then from there, 
I'm going to take some pre-selected questions from the audience, as we do have some time constraints today, of course, um, which I'm going to randomly assign to each candidate. So every candidate is not going to get to answer every question today. However, after this event, each candidate will be sent a form, or may have already been sent a form, who knows, after this, um, where they will have each question have the opportunity to expand on their answer, as well as answer any question they did not have the opportunity to answer before you. So you can keep an eye out for that in the next couple weeks. Um, all right, I think that is everything. And then after this, we're gonna have our mayoral candidates, of which we have two, so please stick around. Um, all right, great, so we're gonna start off with the first question. So, <clears throat> let's do this. Five years ago, the city declared that it, that it would become carbon neutral by 2050. So what is your plan and what are your intended actions to assure that Somerville actually fulfills that promise? So that's the first. Each candidate will have 90 questions, and will you please step up to a microphone when you answer, and we'll start with you, Will. Thank you, everyone, for being here, and thank you for uh, everyone that also contributed to putting this event together. My name is Will Mba, as uh, Julia mentioned. I'm one of the city councilors at large. So first, I want to say that my story being, you know, like someone that came from Cameroon in 2010 and moved to Somerville, fell in love with this great community and decided to be involved. I've always been involved, even right back in Cameroon, you know, through different forms of activism in environmental justice, you know, causes. But in Somerville, I must also tell you that that same relationship continued when I moved to the United States. One of the first projects that I work on when I moved to the city was an environmental justice project. You know, I drove a van with a project led by Doug Broguet in Tufts University, you know, trying to see um, the effects of people living along, you know, the highway that are affected by air pollution. Because we need to actually, as we continue to have this conversation about climate change, we should always know that climate change and climate justice are overlap. So, and the effects of that study were well documented that shows that the people that, you know, live along the highway, which are also low-income people and people of color, are the ones that are disproportionately affected and they uh, affect their cardiovascular system. So these are issues that should be at the front and center of every conversation that we are having. So, on that note, you know, with I myself, I pride myself in being one of the people that have actually voted to increase our tree canopy, you know, just so that we can reduce our carbon footprint, increase our green and open space, also help with permeable surfaces in our infrastructure so that we can actually increase the green scores, retrofitting our, our buildings, because most of the emissions also come from the buildings that we have right now. Most of our Thank buildings you. are all we need to, you know, retrofit them, them, you know, put new green scores in new constructions. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Awesome. All right, JT, up to you. Would you like me to repeat the question? Are you good? I, I, didn't Will just say everything? No. <laughs> um, I think the question was directly towards the goal of city of Somerville okay. being carbon neutral by 2050. Um, and I think it's great to have ambitious goals. I think it's great to have a clear goal set out. Um, but I've seen a lot of city goals. We look at Summer Vision 2030, and uh, I, I'm deeply disappointed with how, how little progress we made towards some of these goals that we all agreed were um, core to our values as a city. So I absolutely feel like the emphasis needs to be put both in, uh, not just in funding, because we can approve funding requests that come to us, um, but from an administrative level on focusing every piece of our city's infrastructure work, every piece of our city's building um, renovation plan, every piece of our city's fleet management, all of these choices that we make, considering it with an intersectional lens that includes environmental justice, includes these critical pathways that we need to take, or else 2050 is just a pipe dream, right? It's, it always stuns me when I go back and I look at the climate change vulnerability analysis that the city published just a few years ago that starkly spells out the risk that we are at um, for not just uh, stormwater flooding events, coastal flooding events due to global warming, and 
heat island effects that are critical public health and public safety impacts on our children, on our elderly. And when we make decisions in the city that are going to catastrophically worsen those issues in pursuit of other goals, we're not taking intersectional lens to it. So, Thank you. I, I, yeah. So I'm happy to approve all the funding requests for the things that we need to get done, but I want to make sure to keep bringing, for myself, to keep bringing that intersectional awareness to all of the different city conversations that we have, because the city has a lot to do. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ben Ewan Campen. So first of all, I want to say I'm incredibly grateful to live in a city where this is not a wedge issue whatsoever. Uh, where there are not people in your local government who are uh, working at cross purposes here. So I think you, you don't need to count on me to have a unique plan that's smarter than everybody else's plan because the city has a comprehensive plan, which I think a lot of people in this room were involved in actually crafting. Uh, that's the Climate Forward plan, which of course, I, I would be surprised if anyone up here gets up and says that they're opposed to that. So I just want to kind of draw attention to a couple specific things that I'm that I consider near-term goals. So one of them is a ban on gas in new construction called the gas ban, which cities around the country have started to look at. Uh, I think, as you all know, so the idea is basically if we want to become carbon neutral, we cannot have another generation of housing built that is being heated by fracked gas. The energy needs to be electric, and we need to move the electric grid to being renewable. That's a specific goal. The problem is, in Massachusetts, cities, it's illegal for us to do that. We can't, uh, and I've been told this by Oliver Sellers Garcia uh, in the back, works for the city, we, we, can't, it would, we would be sued if we tried to do this at the local level by ourselves. So this is going to take a much broader movement and a lot of uh, grassroots activism and kind of legal creativity that I think we have the potential to actually build on. Shout out to Sunrise, thank you for being here today. Uh, and so I think that that should be a goal that our community dedicates itself to and then actually puts in the legwork to get done at the state level and through kind of whatever creative legalities we can come up with. Uh, the other thing, I just want to echo what Councillor Scott just brought up, uh, the equity okay. lens. I think it's the worst case scenario here is that we do the climate forward plan and we become carbon neutral, but we're a city of all rich people. I think it's really critical that we keep in mind, this is not about wrap it up a bit. creating a kind of carbon neutral paradise for the wealthy to live in. We need to constantly be working to keep this a diverse community. All right. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you, Ben. All right. Hi there, I'm Stephanie Hirsch. I'm a counselor, uh, candidate at large and counselor. Uh, so from the, the 2050 plan, the main priorities are uh, buildings and transportation um, and changing the carbon footprint of those. However, there are also other goals that have a smaller impact on the carbon footprint like biodiversity, waste reduction, um, uh, the, the habitat, uh, f factors that affect habitat, and those also matter. And I would love to talk more about um, specific thoughts about those, like the, all three of those, both the ones that have the biggest impact on the 2050 carbon footprint goals, as well as the ones that are related. Uh, I will say though that what I think I bring to office is an ability to bring m many years of municipal management um, experience to try to figure out the win-win solutions whenever we can. And in this case, I think there's some really um, hope, hope and inspiring, hopeful and inspiring um, combinations of solutions. So we can build small, you know, passive houses, units that are right next to shared open spaces and shared indoor spaces like a rec center that don't rely on cars, that are more affordable, that are income integrated. And because we're not relying on cars, we have um, space that we can reclaim some of the street space to make more open space, more affordable housing, more in or shared space, and we should make transit free. So I'm most interested in those solutions that make us excited and hopeful. Thank you so much. Hi all, I'm Kristen Strezzo, and it's nice to see so many familiar faces here. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm a mom and two kids, and I care for my 92-year-old grandmother, and I care for a broad spectrum of fam um, family issues. So when it comes to your question, uh, I think the first, uh, uh, first, I, I love that you brought the attention to the air quality because that's an issue that's really important to me, including sound barriers. Um, I've been doing a lot of work for that, uh, really talking about our air quality because it is an, an issue of all of us versus, and we're in this together. Um, and I have been um, instrumental, uh, working with um, air quality uh, and working with uh, 
uh, residents along this, the I-93 and uh, how that affects um, living in that space and what kind of air filters we can use to best for a best quality of life and air quality in that. I'm glad that that was brought to the attention. Um, I think when it comes to uh, the future of our city and where we go with this, I think it is instrumental that we start putting in trade school, um, with solar and um, renewable energy trade school um, uh, pr uh, study, uh, not studies, um, uh, programs in, in, in the high school and, and funding that immediately to the next generation. I think that's an essential quality. Divesting, of course, from fossil fuels and any form of fracking, not non-negotiable. And, and I'm going to work hard for that. I continue to. This is for all of us. Remember that. And I'm honored to serve you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, this is an awesome turnout. Thank you so much to the, uh, to the organizers uh, for, for bringing us out here on a Saturday. I have a question first. When we see the picture of Greta, what does that mean? Does that mean we're ten done? 10 seconds left. 10 seconds left. Okay, good. Uh, Y'all were getting yelled at here, and I wasn't face. sure what the, what, okay, so Greta means 10 seconds left. Got it. Um, so, hey, listen, here's the thing. Um, I, brilliant answers by um, my colleagues here so far. The thing with, with climate neutral or carbon neutral 2050 is like that's a drop in the bucket. It's, it's not even everything we can do as a city. And even if we do all of those things and we do all the other things that we can do as a city, we're not going to solve climate change. We're not going to stop climate change just with what we do here in Somerville. But what we can do, and, and uh, Stephanie mentioned this and Ben mentioned this, is we can lead. We can be creative, and, and, and if it means doing something that gets us sued, well, let's do that. And if it means coming up with new ideas, Councilor Hirsch sits there and, and, and she speaks out of order all the time because <laughs> she says, well, what, forget all the stuff we're talking about. What if we did this thing over here? And it's like, well, that's a really good idea, right? That's what we have to do. And, and if we are willing to take these bold, brave new ideas and actually push them, find ways to do it, and be willing to put, stick our necks out there. And if it means getting sued, so be it. Well, then that's what we should do. And, and if it means keeping these people in committee late night while I rewrite stuff so that we don't have to walk out of the room and come back two weeks later, that's what I'll be able to bring. And, and I'm glad so far that we've had, um, you know, we've had the willingness to, to, uh, to do that. So that's, we have to look across, the, uh, across the, the board of all the different things that we can do with the city and be willing to lead so that other cities will follow that. Good morning. My name is Jack Connolly. I'm a Somerville native and a former elected official and someone who has actually been uh, very active uh, with transportation related issues. Getting people out of vehicles back in the 70s, we realized the red line could offer a huge impact. Not only has it done so economically, but it has certainly helped the community and has been a huge economic incentive. Incentive is the name of the game. I've had for over 30 years a solar system, hot water system in my house. And I can tell you, as, as a father of three girls growing up, taking a couple of showers a day, I've saved an awful lot of uh, gas as a result of using that solar hot water system. Why aren't we incentivizing people with perhaps a reduction in the property tax for using some of these alternative means of energy? Why aren't we going to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and saying, why don't we give people a reduction in their vehicle registration if they use a hybrid or an electric vehicle? These are the things that a city not only can do, but should be doing. We have the impetus here with people here who are running for office, all of like mind. I think the mayor of a community like Somerville can certainly help lead the way. We're not moving fast enough as a community to take uh, hold of what we have, one of the most progressive places in the country. Senator Ed Markey has led the nation on climate change events. Let's continue to do so. We can do as a community. I'm happy to be part of that if elected. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bill White. I'm a counselor at large, and it's great to see this crowd. I'd like to tell you folks a little bit about my history. 22 years ago, at my first meeting at the Board of Aldermen, I introduced a proposed moratorium for development at Assembly Square. The thought back then was to have a big box center with huge parking fields and one-story buildings. I said that was a crazy idea. It wasted the waterfront. It wasted so much of our valuable land. And I said, let's put a T-stop there. People said, Bill White's crazy. He's still going to sacrifice all this tax money, etc." 
Fortunately, it led to the development of a citywide citizens group, a residence group, the Mystic View Task Force, and we fought for a lot of the things that we have there today. I also introduced way back then a, morat a moratorium on the development of big box stores. I said it was crazy, we're not a suburb, we should not have people driving to big box stores and again waste our land with parking fields. So now the concrete answers to the question are basically threefold. One is we have a capital improvement plan for all of our citywide buildings. As we look at that plan, we should make sure that as we retrofit our buildings, we go towards the goal of carbon neutrality. The second one is our zoning. We should make sure that the zoning has incentives for green and open space. I've seen the green and open space comments on the proposed zoning, and I'm gonna go through it with a fine tooth comb. And the third thing is take into account the green line extension and the community path. Our goal should be to minimize car traffic in the city and take advantage of that. Think about opening our squares to plazas, prohibiting cars, and looking forward to the future to reducing all of our parking fields everywhere, taking into account the, the bicycle traffic that we will now have, especially with the community path Thank and you. the green line. Cars and, cars and parking lots should really be factored out of our zoning and our planning for the future. Thank you. Hi, good morning, I'm Katiana Ballantyne. So I believe in climate change. And I live this not only by my actions as a politician, but as an individual. We, my family has been a car-free family for over, well, nearly 12 years now. We're a family of four. When we bought our house nearly two decades ago, we super insulated it. So we ripped the ceilings down, ripped the walls down in order to insulate in between the walls, the roofs, the rafters, the attics, the, the basements. And why are we doing all this? Because the most important or the most uh, problems that we have with climate change is from buildings and is from cars. So um, I walk, I use public transit, I ride a bicycle. So the question was, what are we doing now, or what do I plan to do in the next five years? Okay, um, one, most recently, uh, I work with all of you. I worked with Larry Yu to write the Green New Deal, create the Green New Deal for Somerville. It's a statement of goals, and it gives us an action plan to move forward. I also worked um, recently with residents of Ward 7, uh, to submit a resolution on the state level to try to get seven new uh, legislations passed that deal with uh, identifying a framework, um, doing carbon pricing, and coming up with new technologies that are in there that we can work on forward. Um, I have, and I'm hoping since my colleagues all signed on to this Green New Deal, that we can do the green minimum ratio, that we can bring Article 97 down to the local level, that um, we can do a native plant species um, um, resolution, right. that in the overhaul zoning, the green factor, I'm really happy that all my colleagues have spoken so well about it because that was something that was submitted by me nearly 18 months ago that I hope will go through uh, when we uh, vote on the new zoning in the next few months. Thank you. <laughs> all right, now we're going to move on to questions from the audience. Um, so our first questioner is Stephen Nutter. Will you please stand up? Amazing. Um, I'll come to you. Don't worry. Uh, so Stephen has been a homo homeowner in Somerville for the past nine years. He, he is the executive director of Green Cambridge, a nonprofit that engages the community of all ages in urban farming, the urban forest, and the urban wilds. All right. Hi, I'm Stephen Nutter. Um, so I was just going to ask you just to kind of reframe your thoughts of, of Somerville here. Um, you know, we have great policies and plans, and as an urban planner myself, it's, you know, it's really great to see, but those things are not always connected to place. So the, the, the boundaries that we have here in Somerville, the land that we have here in Somerville, no matter if it's publicly owned or privately owned or institutional owned, it's still all of our place that we get, that we get our resources from. 
So if you imagine our city uh, as what it used to be, which is a farm and a forest and a wetland and a river's edge, we just happen to have put a lot of buildings and roads on top of all that. It's still there. So if, it's, it, it's, we've done so much that to the point where Somerville is the densest city in New England, which from a sustainability standpoint is actually really, really good. Um, yet from a natu the natural environment still offers so much to our city, even though we've paved over our yards and, 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 and built very large buildings. Um, so we can use these parks to restore our native ecosystems and reduce toxicity in the water and the air. We know these, these things are, are totally true. These are the, the solutions going forward to, to connect our, our public and our, our, uh, our, the, public, the public to place. So if, if broad swaths of residents care about the land inside of our borders and they celebrate our local environment and they participate in the growing cycle, we can definitely make change together in a shared space. So how do you feel we can re-engage residents to participate in the local natural environment? Thank you so much, Stephen. So we're going to start with Will. Go ahead, Will. Thank you, Stephen, for that question. That was a lot of information right there. But I think uh, when I stand here, I'm thinking about a comprehensive plan for the city. We believe. We talked about mass transit. Mass transit, you know, I drove here. It wasn't really, uh, I didn't have a choice. You know, if I really, you know, like they say buses were reliable and everything being equal, I'll probably take the bus and come here. But if I had to, you know, I'll probably be here maybe like 30 minutes late or something. So we talked about having a transportation infrastructure that works so that people should not, you know, have to drive. But so there's all these different combinations. We need to also t encourage people to actually personally engage in the community. We talked about waste. Our waste stream is really massive. How do we like implement composting that works for everybody? Like in Cambridge last year, they started composting and it's working. But in some of it, we don't have the incentive. People have to pay $90 to have a compost bin. So we need to have a comprehensive comp uh, uh, plan so that you can incentivize people to actually practice that together. So, the, sorry? Oh, okay. So that's just one piece, you know, of the puzzle, like to be able to like find ways, you know, to in incentivize people so that they can be inclusive in the process. The people that are disproportionately impacted, they don't have that means to be able to participate in a comprehensive plan that can be beneficial to everybody. That is just one option. So just to review really quick, so each counselor has 60 seconds. Greta means 10 seconds left. Um, and you're up next, JT. <laughs> I am so excited to be up next, because uh, that was like a three minute long question that had a lot of great stuff in it. Um, boy, where do I start with it? The, I, I love talking about the density. Actually, something somebody mentioned earlier, uh, tiny passive houses. Passive house standard is actually easy to reach in larger buildings. Uh, we, can, we can do density. We can do density in intelligent ways that actually allows us to reclaim green space by taking some of these smaller buildings, consolidating, creating green space around these taller buildings. There's some great pilot programs in Canada that I'd love to talk about around that. However, the question was directly about how do we get people re-engaged in their living environment, and that's something that really means a lot to me. Um, I, I run a gym. When I'm not at City Hall, I'm there at 5 in the morning teaching people how to do push-ups and pull-ups, but it's not just a gym. I took that place that was concrete and black roof and turned it into rooftop gardens, created community gardens in the back. Hell, we got a chicken coop. I believe you can only plant one garden at a time, and I believe you can only change the world one conversation at a time. And getting people to put their hands in the dirt is a transform just transformational experience. Um, I think teaching people how much there is to be gained in that, showing how much it can change, how much power and agency they have to change their own world, is the way to do that. And so that's why I love the ambassador programs that we have here, but I think we need to do more of that. And I think the only way to do it is to get people's hands in the dirt. So I'll continue to support the organizations that do and talk to me about chickens if you want afterwards. Thank you. All right, Ben. Um, I, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer such a big question, but one example that really comes to mind. So whenever uh, there's a proposed development in Somerville, it usually starts with a neighborhood meeting. And uh, 
to put it kindly, a lot of the times the folks who come to these meetings are often coming from a place of fear about what's about to happen to their neighborhood, justifiably so. Um, so I just want to give one example. We recently approved the first passive house apartment building in Ward 3 on Bow Street. And the, the public process around that building, I will say, in a lot of ways was being driven by concerns about parking, about density, about height. And it really wasn't until folks in this room started showing up to those meetings specifically to advocate for passive house standards that it kind of broke the logjam in that case. So I hope that, and, and that project has been approved thanks to that. So I hope this doesn't sound like passing the buck, but I think you know politicians are sort of necessary but not sufficient to get the community re-engaged here. And what we really need is to work alongside the, the, the grassroots activists who are kind of actually the network engaging people. That's one small example, but I think kind of expanding that out to the big discussions we're having about publicly owned land and the future of those and how to balance the priorities between affordable housing, commercial development and open space, letting kind of uh, these voices into the room in a very loud way is one of the things that we can do. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Stephanie. Ready? Uh, so something I thought about a lot reading the Climate Forward Plan is a, an idea of a geography-based uh, uh, um, carbon footprint inventory versus global. And so there's only so much you can do at the local level. And as I was thinking about it, I was thinking that we'd have a bigger impact in terms of our world um, if we, every dollar we spent actually was on creating passive houses in North Dakota where it's colder, where the cost of housing to construction is way cheaper. But there's a reason why we care about doing stuff locally as well, and that's because we want to be transformed and we want to be part of the solution. And an example that's been driving me crazy but in, during my term and before that was food waste in the schools and lack of recycling and, um, and just the total overall waste in the foods. It really doesn't have an impact on our carbon footprint. It's minuscule, but it's just driving. I've worked in the school system, it drives me insane to have these kids, like Katie's kids, throw away food, throw away plastic, and it breaks their hearts. They think they're going to be changing the world. And so food, the, the, the school, school department food is almost all meat, which is not particularly culturally sensitive. We don't have dishwashers, and we could look upstream. We can control every morsel of food that comes into our cafeterias. We could look upstream and, make, and completely transform and become a leader in this sector, even though it doesn't have an impact on our carbon footprint. So I think we always have to have this like double bottom line in terms of what we're doing, like how much it transforms us and how much it affects our carbon footprint. Thank you. All right. Our next question is um, by Tina Liu. Will you please stand up? Tina? Hi. Awesome. So I'm just going to introduce you real quick. So Tina Liu and her family have lived in Somerville since 2011. She's a former high school teacher, currently works at the Senior Partner Success Manager for Better Lesson, is a member of the School Site Council at the East Somerville Community School, and her two children attend EC ESCS and the Capuano. Thank you, Tina. Hi, everyone. Um, so as a summer rural resident uh, who bikes daily to school and to work, um, we are often biking along really busy bike path or busy uh, streets without bike lanes uh, where we're constantly breathing in car exhaust. And while my son is a great biker, he bikes next to me on the sidewalk while I'm on the road, um, I'm constantly worried for his safety during our commutes. So we need more designated bike lanes to incentivize, incentivize those who might be scared of biking in the city to be more willing to try it out. And with more and more people moving into Somerville, we need to incentivize community members to use greener methods of commuting. So we can get more cars off the road uh, and motivate people to use public transportation, walk, or bike. I wanna know what your strategies are for how to aim for how to make an impact in this area. Thank you so much. All right, JT, we're going to start with you. <laughs> no, JT. <laughs> Got, caught me by surprise there. Um, <laughs> all right, so can you, can you just give me the, the, last, the, the last sentence of the final question there? Oh, right. Um, I, thank you. And that is, uh, that's actually something that I've been working on right now on Washington Street. Uh, Washington Street is up for repaving in 2021. And right now it's just, hey, we're going to re repave the sidewalks, repave the street, and lay the same stripes down that have been on it. And I think we can do better than that. And I think um, the, 
simple, stupidly simple answer is you have to create a safe environment for people who are not uh, mammals to go biking, uh, middle-aged man in Lycra, right? So like, we need users who are your son. Uh, we need users who are your mother, right? And, and making space for them on the road means we have to create safe environment for that. But we also, we have this road budget. There's all budgets. Um, Washington Street is a 40 foot wide road. So how do we go about making sure that there is an intersectional view of that to say how do we create safe facilities and do it without committing the unforced errors that the city so often does in the planning by not considering some of these intersectional impacts. Like there are going to be users with disabilities that I want to be able to access Lincoln Park, Perry Park. So how do we preserve mobility options for them while still ensuring that we have to make safe facilities or else we will never have people transition to bicycles. So I, I hope that answers the Thank question you. a little bit. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Ben. Uh, so this is an issue where I'm like an extremely hardcore partisan. <laughs> uh, so luckily I don't have a challenger so I can just say this. I'm like 100% in support of bike lanes in all circumstances. Uh, I bike to work. I work in Boston. Me and my wife bike together. And if you do that, you will have my point of view. It's insanely dangerous and terrifying. I've been hit. My wife's been hit by cars. It's just, I'm like, what? I want to measure my words because these have become really hot button issues in Somerville. And I think that's actually really unfortunate because usually the fight is not actually about bike lanes and parking. It, it's become like a stand-in for a kind of culture war that I think is totally inappropriate. Uh, and so the story that I like to tell about this, I, I got doored last year at work. I worked near in the Boston uh, Medical School area. And I got doored into a um, fire hydrant. It was totally fine. And I looked over to scream at the person who had just doored me. And it was a woman carrying her young child on a breathing machine into a hospital. So, obviously it's not her fault, I'm not going to scream at her. And it just, it immediately clicked for me. This is not about us versus them. This is about creating streets where that situation never has to happen. Just get the cars and the bikes apart from each other. So, in these fights, you will know which side I'm on. And I'll also be nice to the people who hate bike lanes. Thank you. All right, Stephanie. Stephanie, you're up. Thank you. Uh, so, as Ben just said, this, um, every, basically every Facebook post, post devolves into like bikes versus cars and it's almost, it's not entirely aligned on class lines, but there's a strong um, connection. And um, I, I also am a car free family and a deep believer in um, pedestrian transit and biking. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, looking at, for example, the parking, uh, Mark Neergang would love to, to talk about this, but when you say, like, if we pulled Somerville right now, and probably 60-70% of people would say they would like to be car-free, and I feel like it's, it, you know, we should change our parking regulations to help those people become car-free and get their cars completely off of the road, off of um, storage, and um, to have, so basically to have it be more incentive-based so that I don't think I want to be beating up like a 70-year-old longtime resident who parks in front of their house um, when there's an opportunity to have it be really positive. I would love to see transit free, see how many people we can convert in that way. Thank you. Kristen? When I hear this question, I see this very much as an equity issue and bringing everyone to the table because, and I, I also echo that, uh, that we don't want to make this a cars versus bikes issue. Caring for my 92-year-old grandmother, I can't you can't put her on a bike. I have to drive her to the cardiologist. That's not an option. And with that, I think most important is communication and being on the same page and working towards communication. We've got the bike lanes on Broadway and I'm for, I'm, uh, the, the bus lanes that were recently put in. I'm really for them. But if we don't have proper communication, my concern is that we're going to have some injuries because if we have drivers confused on how to use them, I don't want a cyclist in any way uh, being part of that confusion in the in the the bus lane. So and and you can all help in this way of getting out the, the the information and communication out there on on the the bus lanes on how properly to use this. This is a community effort uh, for this. I want more more safe bike lanes. I want more safe methods of transportation. But we have to do this commun with communication together as a team. And that's, that's one of our, my goals as, as I see this. Thank you so much. All right. Our next question um, is going to be from Meredith Elbaum. Will you please stand up? Amazing. So Meredith has lived in Somerville for the past 18 years. 
Um, albeit with a brief stint in Cambridge. All right, it's fine. Uh, she and her husband own three properties in Somerville, and their two young sons are students in Somerville. They also recently renovated the house to be 100% electric. Meredith is an architect and is currently the executive director of the U.S. Green Building Council in Massachusetts. All right, how am I getting to you? So we've said that Somerville, we know that we're committed to being carbon neutral by 2050. And as you know, buildings account for 66% of our carbon emissions. So any building that we build today, right now, in Somerville that's not zero energy, that uses fossil fuels, we're going to have to spend money to retrofit that to meet our, meet our 2050 goals. My kid plays soccer. It's kind of like scoring on the other team's goal. That's what we're doing. So a new report released by the U.S. Green Building Council of Massachusetts, an organization I work with, says that zero energy buildings are feasible today for low and even no additional costs. The report's available on our website. You can go read it across different building types. And not just that, but if you look at the life cycle of these buildings, they're actually really great investments. You can make money off of them. So the report debunks the myth that zero energy buildings need to cost more money. So with that, what are you going to do to stop scoring against ourselves? And what's the plan for all new construction in Somerville to be zero energy? Thank you so much. So Ben, we're going to start with you. OK, I figured out the system, Good job. how this works. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for this question. I was, while you were talking, I was thinking the term natural gas of how these built, you guys know what that means? It's fracked, right? This is coming from fracking. This is what, apparently we're all opposed to it, but then we like natural gas and every week we're approving permits for new natural gas infrastructure to come into Somerville. So obviously I already spoke about a ban. Uh, I absolutely believe we need to move forward to that with that. And in addition, as part of the comprehensive zoning overhaul, one of the kind of legal paths forward is to do this through incentives, right? To make it much, much, much better to, you can develop something that you don't really want to develop if you use gas, uh, but you're kind of opened up to a much more lucrative world of development if you're going forward. So I am fully on board with this. Thank you for that question. And I think there, it's going to take a diversity of strategies, and I think Somerville is very much on board to do them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I would echo what Ben just said. Um, as I understand it, in the new zoning overhaul, it's one, uh, one option in terms of a height, like you get extra height if, you're, if you meet certain energy efficiency goals. You also get certain height bonuses, potentially, if you meet certain affordability or open space add-ons. So how much you, I mean, that's a question for us as a council, like how much should we make that manda mandated or an incentive-based? One point that I think about a lot is what do we do about our older buildings? So like when we have gut rehabs of the triple-deckers, I think they, you know, basically in their flip for luxury condos or we've infill development for the five and six, five units or fewer, they, they add absolutely no community benefits that I'm aware of except making investors better off. I think we should lay on every possible constraint that we have, affordable housing, no new cars, passive house, et cetera. They could be the guinea pigs because right now I don't see them adding any benefit to the community. So I would like to start there too. Thank you. Thank you. I don't really have much more to add. I'm all for it. I'm really grateful that you are, for your activism and bringing that, that, argument, that point forward, I'm all on board. I'm grateful to work alongside all that want to put that forward. Let's go now. It's awesome. <laughs> all right. Councilor Davis. Yeah, um, what Ben and Stephanie said. <laughs> I mean, I, it's hard to improve on those answers. Um, you know, so let's look at, 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 in addition to trying to think of how to say something else, um, we're building this great big high school and it's not going to be as environmentally friendly as it absolutely should be. And that's a total miss and that's a failure on the, on the part of the administration. And I know that there were people that fought against that and, and fought for the, um, the sustainability measures that we should have been putting in there. Um, it's been mentioned already that we have a, a whole raft of city buildings that we're looking at right now, a capital plan that uh, is taking a look at city properties uh, across the city. And I'll be damned, if we can't do it ourselves as a city, then we're really missing something out here. I do think that we will see 
sooner than uh, I think we fear a developer coming in and saying, I'm going to build a, a completely 100% renewable, you know, uh, energy-free building. And once that happens, there's going to be no excuse. So the sooner we can encourage that through the types of incentives that uh, Councilor Hirsch talked about, uh, the better, and, and then we'll be on our way. But let's lead, let's lead with our own buildings first. Thank you. All right, uh, so the next question was submitted by Julie Wood. Um, she unfortunately had something come up this morning, could not make it, so I'm gonna offer her question to all of you. Um, but so Julie Wood lives in Teal Square with her family and has been a Somerville resident for 16 years. And she's a deputy director of the Charles River Watershed Association, Association and serves on the city's commission on energy use and climate change. So this is what she wants to say. Um, so although no one really thinks of Somerville as a waterfront community, we have an impressive amount of riverfront shoreline, and some recent developments have made the river more accessible and celebrated in the community. That being said, the city has not always made river protection and water quality a priority. Whether it's working to reduce combined sewer overflows or improve stormwater treatment, Investments in green infrastructure, riverbank restoration, and expanding tree canopy would help not only clean the Mystic and Charles Rivers, but protect our community from climate-related weather extremes. So would you support making these investments? What additional ideas do you have to ensure the city is doing what it can to protect the river and prepare to potential future flooding? So Stephanie, we're going to start with you. Uh, that's, uh, I don't know as much as I would like to know about that, so I certainly enjoy being by the Mystic, and I know that like with the renovation of Draw 7, there is a lot of interest, and I think this will be announced. I mean, I think this is going to be the case that the, the, the Draw 7 um, field will be um, an area that can absorb water as there is overflow by the, the, by the dam and by the river. Um, the, in terms of water sewer infrastructure, there's both like, um, the on-site uh, water management I, uh, um, opportunities, and we can do that, and that's complementary to what the city is doing in terms of changing the large underground infrastructure, and you can do both of them. Um, tree Canopy, we have this amazing group, the Somerville Urban Forestry, now a committee that has basically outlined a bunch of steps that all seem perfectly right, um, and I think we should do them all, and I'm supportive. Um, so yes, I'm happy to learn and, and support whatever. Thank you. Kristen. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I, I see, and I live along the Mystic, and it's awesome. Um, I, I see river bank protecting as uh, protecting as well the tree canopy, and with that, uh, expanding on the work of what Mothers Out Front have have been doing to uh, take to uh, take gas companies to task for gas leaks that are uh, killing the trees. And I believe that it was Denise Provo that put forth a bill this week, and um, we need to expand her work on that, uh, that would allow that to be uh, possible if we can take gas companies and make them responsible for the gas leaks that are killing the trees that are affecting the canopy, the tree canopy, which the tree canopy we need and we need to protect. It's a trickle down and making sure that we're all uh, working together to make that that work as much as possible. Um, I'm committed to doing that and want to work alongside you with that. Thank you. Thank you. Be honest. Who here sent us an email when we when there was a proposal to raise the water sewer rates this year? Nobody in this room. <laughs> I'm gonna go back and look and keep you all honest. <laughs> We're dumping raw sewage into the Mystic River more and more frequently because the 50-year storms come a couple times a year now. Don't quote me on that, I'm kind of making that stat up. But you all can relate, relate to what I'm talking about. If we don't accelerate the, the repair and replacement and disconnection of our combined sewer system, we're, we're just going to keep dumping raw sewage into the Mystic River. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, we, I'm happy to say that, as many you all know, I'm sure, um, finally, after years and years and years and years of trying and failed efforts, passed a private tree ordinance. And it was one of those times when I locked everybody in the room and said, we're not leaving until we get this done. I'll write whatever we need. Um, so, you know, applause for my colleagues for, uh, for, for getting that done. We, you know, we have to do that. We have to do all of those things, and, and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. It's going to be expensive. We're going to have to keep doing it. Um, I worked with the administration to push an increase in the uh, inflow and infrastructure payments that developers have to pay to actually help 
pay for some of those separations so it doesn't all fall on our shoulders, your shoulders, my shoulders, as taxpayers, payers, but it's still a drop in the bucket, uh, no pun intended. It's, um, it's going to be really hard and it's going to really hurt, but we don't have a choice. We have to do it. Thank you. As many of the panelists have mentioned, it's the, not the people in this room, everybody here is well aware and it basically is incentivized. How do we let everybody else know? Isn't it time that there could be some sort of a educational curriculum, especially starting in the school systems, where young people can be made aware of the terrible and environmental impacts that the sewer overflows going into the Mystic or the problems. Sure, Deer Island has made an incredible uh, uh, increase in the quality of water in, in, in the greater Boston area, but still, there are days when the bacteria count is way up because it's still gonna cost additional money. So we have to give people an incentive and maybe you have to give some type of a, um, a property tax relief for those people who do take the time and energy to put into adding additional uh, uh, improvements to their sewer systems in a private development or as a community, we have to do more ourselves. I think the impetus is here in Somerville. Thank you. Thank you. So before we move on to our next question, I just want to remind everyone again that we do have interpretation available in Portuguese, Spanish, and Haitian Creole. Will our interpreters please stand up just for a moment? Thank you so much. Okay. So our next question is um, from Ben Echevarria, who's way back there. All right. I'm going to make my way back there. So Ben was born and raised in Somerville. He is the executive director of the Welcome Project, a community-based organization that works to build the voice and collective power of Somerville immigrants to participate and shape community decisions. Thank you. Thank you. After Hurricane Maria destroyed Puerto Rico, it's estimated that about 7,000 uh, Puerto Ricans left the island and moved to Massachusetts. More recently, the Bahamas were decimated by Hurricane Doran, and the Baham and Bahamians have so far been denied entry into this country. As we see more hurricanes and harsher weather as the effects of climate change take place, what do you think we can do as a city to accommodate these climate change refugees? Thank you, Ben. So Kristen, we're going to start with you. Everything. I think we should do everything we can possibly do. I think that if it's necessary, that we should put more money into the budget and consider that, putting more money into the budget to do that. And also um, asking, asking what we can do, because it's not assuming what we need. It's asking what our refugees need from us and how we can be. Um, I think it starts with the budget and we go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great question, Ben. Um, you know, I, I think that this city, more than many, has has definitely expressed that we have open arms to uh, to people who need to uh, find a place where they can feel safe and be a part of the community and feel connected. Um, the mayor is the one that that is statutorily, um, you, you know, specifically and uniquely uh, allowed to set the budget and, and say what we're going to spend our money on, we can only say no. Um, or we can say yes, but we can't, we can't actually you know, say we want to spend more on this or spend more on that. Um, what we can do are, are create environments where uh, people do feel welcome and do feel safe. I, I worked with, with Ben uh, this past year to pass what at the time, and um, it may still be, but I know there's others, the, the, the most aggressive, most uh, forward-looking uh, welcoming community ordinance in the entire Commonwealth. And one of the key aspects of that was um, to not dictate, but to uh, guide police interactions with undocumented people, particularly in a traffic stop. And it, it's one small, specific scenario, but it's the kind of thing that um, if, we, if we do a series of those, if we do this right, we, we, we 
continue to present to our undocumented people and to anyone else who might be coming that this is a place where all are welcome and you can participate and hopefully we have, we have programs that are funded that will help them uh, acclimate and, and become a part of the community. But um, it's, it's all about uh, doing the small things that we are able to to, uh, uh, to make it as easy and to make them feel as welcome as possible. Uh, well, Ben, thank you for the question. Until you mentioned that 7,000 figure, I don't think anybody had any idea of just how many people uh, did land here in Somerville. So obviously if there's 7,000 in Somerville, there's probably thousands in Cambridge and Boston as well who uh, have landed here as a result of the problems in Puerto Rico. It's a regional issue. We have to work with our surrounding communities, Somerville, Cambridge, Boston, for uh, place. Just like when there's a, there's a fire, the Red Cross is immediately available to help people move out of that uh, building and somewhere at least on a temporary basis to provide the shelter. I think the wherewithal is certainly here in, in Somerville, as uh, people have already mentioned, but it's a regional issue. Our local communities and our budding cities and towns have to be in together and work with state and uh, federal officials in making sure that there's a common sense solution to making sure that people are safe, even for a short period of time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Oh boy, I finally get to answer a question. Um, I guess in the past I've supported resolutions in favor of DACA, in favor of temporary protected status, and also in favor of the DREAM Act. And as a community we've done that, and, and Lance mentioned as well the, um, the ordinance. Ben, I'm going to answer your question a little bit differently. Because one of the things that struck me, and I would have responded to another question, is we haven't done any outreach and environmental issues really to our community of foreign languages. Um, we have, you folks have interpreters here, but when we have a lot of public hearings and things, especially in the zoning, haven't heard any options of, of translation, reaching out to the community in different languages and getting their input to see how climate change is you know, impacting them. Because as we look at the audience here, there's not too many folks from the minority communities, and I think it's incumbent upon us as elected officials and as a community to reach out to them as well to get their input. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move on to our next, sorry, next question. Um, so the next question is from Erica Fallinger, who, because she's a physician at Cambridge Health Alliance, was on call today, unfortunately, so she couldn't make it in. But she's lived in Somerville for 14 years, and I'm going to offer her question to you. Um, so climate change already impacts our lives here in Massachusetts. Public health tra tracking and data tell us we can expect to experience impacts such as increased number of very hot days and poor air quality, increased injuries from stronger storms, increased risk to infrastructure, residential and commercial buildings, increased risk of water con contamination and vector-borne illnesses as the range of mosquitoes and ticks that carry diseases expands. So how will Somerville respond to some of these effects, specifically water contamination, having been watching the huge project in Union Square, an emergency response in strong storms, and how would Somerville handle disruption of portable water supply and sewer, and how much resilience do we have? So with this, we're going to start with Councillor Davis. Boy, that's a good one to start with. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of uh, the answer to that question is 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 uh, goes back to a lot of things we've already talked about. Um, we have a, a subsurface infrastructure system that is 150 to 200 years old, which sounds really bad, but the people who know this stuff tell us that that's actually about the end of its expected life. So we're not it's quite as bad as it sounds, but we've got to fix that. Um, and, and I mentioned the the, the CSOs, the combined sewer outflows into uh, the Alwife Brook and the Mystic River. Um, as many of you know, or the folks who are, are watching us after, it also goes into our basements, right? And it goes into our yards, and it goes into our streets, and people lose cars. People, that may not be the worst thing in the world in this group, but, um, <laughs> but it, you know, honestly, like, the, 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 the one th and, and the strongest thing we can do to address those issues raising this question is to invest in, in disconnecting that system invest in containment measures like we have in Union Square, like are, are proposed at Nunziato, um, you know, in, in embracing the, uh, 
novel ideas like smaller uh, containment bioswales, anywhere where we can help water go, because it's not stopping, it's gonna keep coming. And we have to figure out a way to, to accommodate it in the, in the short term, in the immediate term, and then get it out of here cleanly and properly uh, in the, you know, after that. Thank you. Mr. Connolly? Uh, thank you. The, uh, it all comes down to planning. Everybody's well aware of the effects of global warming. It's, uh, it, it's proven that the intensity of storms are coming much more frequently. The primary reason for government existence is to provide for the public safety, and that's especially during particularly damaging times. Hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, winter emergencies, we have to be ready and planned as a community to be able to, number one, deal with the impact of a storm, how to deal with the flood surges, how to deal with overflows. Those issues have to be planned for. So to have a ready and able police, fire, emergency management, and most importantly, DPW, Public Works, ready and available to implement a strategy for a, a major catastrophe has to be in place and planned for. Working with MMA and the, and the federal government for support, particularly being close to the coast as we are, is a primary and most important significant item to set a goal for. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilor Wright. It isn't just the future, it's today. A bunch of us were at the Ward 2 Resistat meeting where folks in a couple of neighborhoods that are flood prone were talking about raw sewage now backing up in, in a heavy rainstorm. So it's real important that we take the measures, as Councillor Davis mentioned, about improving our water and sewer infrastructure, but also moving forward, making sure with the developments that there's not off flow, that they're retaining tanks in, in the developments that hold the water, um, moving forward, requiring pervious surfaces, because some people talk about permeable, permeable that really doesn't do it. Um, both for the city, we should consider when we are improving, improving buildings, removing concrete or whatever and putting in pervious, um, as well as new developments, because pervious not only allows a greater circulation into, into the soil, but it also removes a lot of contaminants that otherwise flow in, like when you use permeable. So those are things as we move forward, both in the zoning and again in our capital improvement plan that should we definitely take into account, and also have an emergency response plan set up for things like making sure we can provide uh, sufficient water and working with the state along the Mystic River to make sure that their plans for development and improvement along the Mystic River take into account global warming and the flooding that's going to take place. Thank you. President Palatine. Um, thank you. So I'm going to sort of switch the topic a little bit. It's about this, but it's how do we get to it. We haven't talked about revenue generation. We need more revenue. We need office commercial in here to relieve the burden so we're not displacing the people who live here now. If we can get, uh, because the commercial tax base um, brings in more revenue than the residential tax base. Okay, so why is this important? Because then it can help us, instead of passing the burden of paying for all this infrastructure work onto the residences through your water and tax, uh, uh, your uh, water fees and water and sewer fees, um, it's trying to capture that through getting in more revenue through the... Um, uh, uh, through having more office commercial. Um, stormwater design. Uh, we fight so hard to try to engineer everything. It would be great if in Union Square and also in Ward 7 along Alewife Brook, as we're looking to redevelop the public housing there, that they actually use the stormwater as a feature or part of uh, their design instead of always trying to redirect it. We can't always engineer our way out of things. Thank you. Thank you. So our next question is from Josiah Adamopoulos. Will you please stand up? Hi. Uh, so Josiah um, has been a renter in Somerville for the last three years. She commutes by bicycle to her job as a senior data analyst at the Massachusetts Behavioral Health Partnership in downtown Boston. Okay. Here we go. Hello. Um, my question is about natural gas. Natural gas is 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. 
Based on the 2013 IPCC report on climate change, the Environmental Defense Fund calculated that methane emissions from oil and gas industry are responsible for as much as 25% of climate change. <clears throat> we know that natural gas infrastructure is complicated and are hard to maintain as we can see from the trees dying in East Somerville to last year's explosion in the Merrimack Valley. Massachusetts re Utilities reported in 207 unrepaired gas leaks in Somerville in 2018, which is the 20th out of 240 reported cities and towns. And we know those counts are conservative. What will you do to reduce the reliance on natural gas infrastructure in Somerville? Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Connolly, we're going to start with you. Number one, I'll emphasize the incentives to alternative energy resources. Number two, the gas companies, whether it's Eversource, National Grid, uh, Columbia, whoever, if there are unrepaired leaks in the city, no more street opening permits until those streets are repaired and done satisfactorily as a immediate means to get going. But the incentivization of alternative means of, of resources, especially for homeowners, is a, a primary concern but those natural gas leaks, I believe the gas company just allows sometimes gas to escape so that there won't be a buildup of pressure. That practice has to stop, and that's an issue that we can deal with right here locally by withholding building permits until those things are done. Thank you. Thank you. See, one of the things that I did was I introduced an ordinance similar to one that was introduced in the city of Boston to strongly regulate natural gas transmission companies, um, worked with mothers out front on that. Unfortunately, aspects of the Boston Ordinance were struck down that also had an impact on ours. Um, but I'm chair of the Committee on Public Utilities and Public Works, and recently National Grid wanted to um, improve their uh, system in only certain areas, but only improve piping in others where there was a strong gas, uh, gas leaks. So basically, as um, Councillor, uh, former uh, Alderman uh, Conley said, as we can utilize pressure, and basically I was able to have them commit that instead of just um, patching, that they would put in um, new piping. So that would eliminate the leaks. So that's basically an example of how we can utilize our power in a concrete sense to deal with natural gas. And also we have to promote alternatives. For instance, again, with the new zoning in our own buildings, how about solar panels? One of the things that people mentioned to me along the Green Line extension was why not have solar panels constructed along that to capture the electricity, which would then, I mean, to capture the solar power, which then could be used as opposed to fossil fuel to help Thank take you. fossil fuels out of the grid. So sometimes think out of the box. Thank you. President Ballantyne. Thank you. So 100% um, behind what was uh, said there, too. Um, also, you know, we have a community choice um, aggregation, so going 100% uh, behind that is uh, uh, really important. Um, natural gas, um, I would also support in terms of the zoning. Uh, that uh, we try to come up with whatever way is possible to be creative in uh, incentivizing if we can't mandate um, uh, the, the zoning of, uh, of uh, the transform areas. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, since about 60, over 65% of the emissions coming from uh, the greenhouse gases are from the buildings and also the residences, uh, the residential old stock that trying to come up with incentives or in an aggregate way to try to help families move off of um, gas uh, or fuel uh, for renewable energies and solar is also a way to go. Thank you. Councillor Buck? Finally, I get to speak as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this is, you know, thank you for asking that question. This is uh, something that also I've been considering. So I think we should provide uh, electric, you know, vehicle charging station at all gas stations. 
that will also really, you know, like help. And also, like, I will echo the sentiments of my colleagues, you know, like to incentivize homeowners that are willing to, you know, put solar on their roofs. Another possibility is also to explore the possibility of having like a community solar farms where people can all invest in it and take credit on their bills. And uh, there's one thought that I have, which is a little controversial, but I need to think through it really well. I implement like a carbon tax, you know, why also considering a low income community that can get maybe some form of a rebate at the end of the year because that's something I don't want us just as a city to implement a carbon tax here and then somebody goes to water war time or, or some other neighboring city to buy gas. You Thank know, you. we need to be able to have a comprehensive plan that works for everybody. Thanks. Thank you. All right, our next question comes from uh, Monty Allen. Will you please stand up? Hi. Uh, so Monty has been a homeowner in Somerville with his family for three and a half years. Um, he is a retired senior director of development for CARE, which focuses in large part on the impacts of global warming on poor populations worldwide. And he was a member of CARE's delegation to the 2014 United Nations COP20 climate talks in Lima, Peru. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, Meredith Elbaum did a really great job at laying the case out for why uh, reducing and ultimately eliminating greenhouse uh, gas emissions from buildings has to be a priority. Uh, and so obviously our policies need to reflect that. Uh, but there's a related consideration, and that's how to encourage and motivate building owners and landlords to maximize the energy efficiency of their buildings and to increase uh, their use of renewable energy. It's one thing to recognize the merits of retrofitting buildings toward common neutrality, but it's another thing to persuade building owners to actually engage in that effort. This is a, an area that I've given some thought to and would like to be involved in, but I'm interested in your thoughts about how we might proceed. So if you were elected, how do you think Somerville should actively go forward motivating and persuading building owners to invest in the carbon neutrality of uh, their buildings and in the uh, uh, maximum use of renewable energy? And what do you think renters can do to motivate their landlords to make these investments? Thank you. Councilor White. That's an excellent question. It's something I've thought about for a long time because I think as Councilor Ewan Campen said, our hands are sort of tied because of state regulations. So that I don't believe in, in converting, for instance, or improving a gut renovation or whatever, you could put those requirements in that the building be carbon neutral. So what we have to do is think about incentives. How can we incentivize um, homeowners to do that? And one of the ways to do it is through grants. Basically, you can have no interest or low interest loans to homeowners who would say take steps to make their buildings you know more carbon neutral um, it would be nice if you could give them a tax break for instance on their property taxes now that's not immediately available under some of the law um, I'm sorry under state law because of the Department of Revenue regulations but it's something that we should really consider about a home rule petition to allow us to do that because if we do that other communities may do that as well. So, you know, we can always try here in Somerville, but the most effect would be if you could get things statewide, especially in a lot of the urban areas where they already have homes like we have that were built 100, 120 years ago, which have older systems, heating systems, etc. Thank you. President Ballantyne? Thank you. I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, too, because a decade ago I was working in Roxbury with Alternatives for Community Environments and Chinese Progressive Association in Chinatown and Boston Workers Alliance to try to employ local people uh, to in the green economy, and it was uh, to develop a uh, business where they could be employed in weather, uh, weatherizing. So using the money that is gathered through MassSafe, 
um, to help employ local people to then pitch the idea and try to give them the, the equations on if you weatherize your home, uh, property owners, whether you're owner-occupied or whether you're non-owner-occupied, um, what, what is the payback there? And um, it was, it was a, a challenge. And so I'm, I would say I'm not so versed on it. So the idea of a uh, grants, um, you know, I think is, is a, a wonderful idea. I think also looking out at what our state legislature is doing, because many times there's the intersection of what the state controls that we can't do here. So partnering with uh, those legislators that are working on uh, 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 trying to combat climate change is, is another way to go at it. Thank you. Councilor Muff? Thank you for that question. I actually, I thought about it also before coming because this is something that we all think about, you know, on the council. Because I know that, you know, for new construction, there are stricter environmental regulations for them to follow. But for all buildings, there's very little incentive for homeowners to kind of retrofit their building. So I have just, you know, like that, you know, we require mass home energy audit for buildings built before 2000. And of that, they, we can get all that start. And then also require energy star efficient appliances to replace old ones. We can mandate, you know, uh, most of the landlords to do that. And then on top of that, we can also continue to incentivize them to put green roofs, you know, like rooftop stars, and also weatherization is also like an effective way that we can use to, you know, reduce energy consumption. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Thank you. Uh, the question was about landlords and how we can encourage them to retrofit. Um, you know, we, we have laws right now. Uh, we have encouragements, we have requirements. Uh, that aren't being met. This, this council saw fit to put in some flooding and sewer protections so, to deal with the sewer backups into people's basements. So you have to have a check valve now uh, in most of Ward 2. I found a house that was just done last year that didn't have one in there. So it's, it's not just having the laws. Those are perhaps necessary or desirable, but they're not sufficient. Compliance is a huge part of this. So even if you have the programs, I have landlords in Ward 2 uh, not, don't even talk about how energy efficient their buildings are. Their buildings are sitting empty right now. I, I tie it back to the, the question that Ben Eshavri asked. How, how could we house these climate refugees? We can't. And it's not just going to be the climate refugees from around the world who are coming here. We are going to have climate refugees here in Somerville. As increasing parts of Ward 2, as increasing parts of this housing stock goes underwater, working class families and even new construction are going to be underwater. We are going to have climate refugees here. So my answer to you is I would love to encourage these landlords to retrofit and make these buildings more energy efficient. But when we build the buildings by God, we can make sure they're done right. And it can be what we can do, not just with our high school, but with an aggressive public housing program that does consolidate into energy efficient buildings, that does consolidate, that creates green space, that creates resiliency in the climate. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I may be a little pessimistic about our ability to um, wrangle landlords into behaving better, but I, I think we have to take a more dramatic approach to what truly is a crisis. Thank you. All right, so the last two questions um, are related, so I'm going to introduce our question askers and then pass the mic off to them. Um, so first we have uh, Sarah Sweeting, which is right over here. So Sarah Sweeting is a senior at Somerville High School and a graduate of the Healy School, and she was born and raised in Somerville and serves on the city's Urban Forestry Committee, which is super awesome. And then our other question asker is Stefan Cinnamon, who has lived in Somerville for 13 years. He is the president of the Mystic Tennis Association, co-chair of Summer Vision 2040, a member of the Somerville Education Foundation, a board member, um, a board member for housing stability, and a Pop Warner coach in Somerville. He gets around. So <laughs> I'm going to pass the mic off to them. Here you go, Sarah. Uh, ladies first. Oh, thank you. Cool. OK. So according to the city's climate change vulnerability assessment report, Vulnerable populations, including the elderly, disabled, children, low-income residents, residents with low educational attainment, and residents with limited English proficiency are often disproportionately impacted by weather events. What do you think is the best way to make your efforts and policies accessible to everyone in the city? Um, 
Right. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. Um, I know. Thank you for the intro, Julie. Goodness gracious. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Looking at all these um, friendly, uh, some familiar faces. It's really nice to have everybody here today. I uh, want to extend to the uh, Board of Council. Uh, thank you so much for everything that you guys do in the mayor of the city. Um, you know, Will, thank you again for letting us use those parks. Our football team didn't have nowhere to go, so appreciate you guys stepping up and making that happen. Ben, it was a pleasure testifying with you at the State House. It's an honor working with you, Councilwoman Hirsch, and the Friends of Foss. We're going to improve that park, definitely, and I appreciate everything that you do. Ah, oh, Candidate Strauzo. You just keep on going. I appreciate you coming down to the Mystic Picnic. That was really nice of you and talking about the air quality. Ah, oh, Councilman White seeing you there as well is fantastic. And, Ah, Madam President, speaking to you at Art Beats about how we can definitely improve the city it meant a lot to me. And knowing that we have so many great individuals out here in the crowd as well, seeing friends that were um, on Summer Vision 2040 along with me and seeing candidates for uh, school committee is awesome as well. Um, and uh, psh, Mr. Conley, I apologize. There is definitely one person who is not worried about global warming, but we won't bring up his name. Uh, going up into it, though, uh, Somerville is a diverse community, and I just wanted to focus on diversity as color. We also have a lot of things I bring into it, age, religion, and I'm looking at these two young people over here who are high school students, act your age and be asleep this, uh, this early on Saturday morning, please. I appreciate you guys coming out. We know that our future is heading in the right direction, and uh, these two definitely have that going on. Uh, with over 50, uh, 50 languages spoken in schools in Somerville, and there are many low-income communities in the city, including the one that I'm president of, it's a little tough of a question though, but please. How can a culture of climate action extend to a full section of Somerville? Good luck with that question. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. So each of you are gonna have a chance. Sorry, what? Oh, absolutely. Um, Steph's question? Yes, okay. How can a culture of climate action extend to a full cross section of Somerville? Um, so each, I'm happy to um, reiterate, uh, both of these questions, each of you are going to have a chance to answer them with 60 seconds each. So we'll start off. Do you want to start, Will? Okay. Do you want me to repeat the question? Yes, I heard the, the first one. Steven, your question is... Uh, the, no, no, I, I, got the, I got that one. Yeah, Steve, yes, yeah, can you repeat your question? Yes. Uh, so uh, my question was, how can we create a culture... Um, for climate action extent, how can, a clim how can a culture of climate action extend to a full cross section of the Somerville? So uh, great plan for us. Thank you. So thanks for both questions. Those are questions that they all relate to me personally, also applies to my personal story. I'm gonna start with the first one that I talked about uh, disproportionately affected you know, communities which is something that I said in my introduction, you know, that when we are talking about climate change, we should always make sure that we also talk about climate justice, you know, and then I mentioned about how my first job, volunteer work in the United States was here right in Somerville, working with, uh, you know, an environmental justice project, making sure that uh, people along I-93 that are disproportionately affected by highway traffic in, can actually be looked upon and then provide solutions. This research was well-documented, well-proven, community-based participatory research. And so it, it speaks volume because then we saw that this are the, we need sound barriers around those areas. You know, we need filtration because those are like the, these are the same people that, you know, nobody talks about them, they don't make the news. We here, we should be able to advocate for them. And so on the grand scheme of things now, to relate now to Stephen, this is like a segue. We have is, to just wrap it up. Okay. So we have to really segue. It's like we need more outreach, you know, to be able to like bring people to the table. Like Councillor White said, when you look in here, you really, the people that we are preaching, we are preaching to the choir. So we need to have more, you know, engagement, more outreach, go out you know, like to these communities and ask, you know, like exactly. engage them in conversation and yeah, know exactly what is going on and how we can help them. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, I'm going to be a stickler because we're running out of time. I'm so, I'm sorry. It's okay. Councillor Scott, go ahead. In my very first, I, 
by the way, thank you for both of those questions. In my very first answer tonight, I talked about that climate change vulnerability analysis. And I talked about the need to have an intersectional understanding uh, when we make all of these decisions. In my last answer, I talked about, was it, I said, talked about public housing, and that's it. That's it. Somerville was not built according to a plan. We, somebody at the very start of the night talked about uh, how this was farms and rivers, and then basically in the period from 1880 to 1920, we went from that to what we have now. If we are going to transform Somerville into a resilient community, one that has equity, that brings along everybody and makes room for the people that we need to make room for, we do need to take a larger, a larger view of using our resources of land, of energy, and I think a lot of that has to come from an aggressive public housing program so that we can get it done right and make sure that what gets built serves everybody in the community both from an energy efficiency standpoint, a density standpoint, and from a green space standpoint. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Scott. Councilor Ewan Campin. So thank you for these amazing questions. So if we do everything that we talked about here today, uh, but only rich people live in Somerville, I think we failed. And I think we need to think about Somerville as a place, if you're born here, it's like a lottery ticket. You get to, this is an unbelievable place to get to spend your life. This kind of community, these schools, these resources, this kind of vibrant community. That should not be restricted to rich people. So I think what we need to do, I want to bring up the example of the Community Benefits Agreement in Union Square. The strategy there was we're not going to take just one or two wins in one of these sectors. We're going to look at all of these issues together, and it's going to be everybody in, nobody out. So that means affordable housing, that means good local jobs, that means worker-owned cooperatives, that means environmental justice, that means good public transportation, that means immigrants' rights, and you can't just take some of them at the expense of the others. So I think we need to kind of have a solidarity mentality for all of these issues. We can't approach these as one-offs where we say, all right, we got a passive house here, and so we're good on all the other stuff. We need to kind of Thank stick you. together on all these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Hirsch. Uh, great questions. First, I think, I don't have the data, but uh, low-income households in Somerville probably already have the smallest footprint of everybody. And so maybe the first step would be to just say thank you, and what can we do to make it easier to let you to live? Do you, is it free transit? Is it a, a heat pump that gives you air conditioning in the summer? And speaking of... Um, where did stuff go? The Summer Vision 2040 housing is the number one thing for me. So like if you look at, right now we're on a path to have 10% affordable housing in 2040. And if you look at, right now we have 67% uh, low income, 50% in our school system, 50% of our students are first language, not English. If we go down to what Concord's numbers are, which has the same percent affordable, that's 4% low income and 5.6% first language, not English. So to echo Ben's point, Let's, you know, keep our families here first, second, tell us, we can ask them, hopefully people can become in leadership positions, say what can we do to help you continue to live and live well in your small carbon footprint? How can we learn from you all about how to live with five people in a little tiny apartment? Thank you. One last time, my name is Kristen Strezzo, and I hope I'm not counted against, my seconds aren't counted against for adjusting the mic. Okay, uh, I love your questions. Thank you for asking, and Steph, wherever you are, thank you, because we have to talk about, my goal is to, I respect the work of the City Council, and I'd be honored to work alongside you. I, I, I respect you all. Um, and with that, I want to bring equity to the table with that. When it comes to the, the, the some of the housing authority, they don't even have, when I've talked to residents there, they want to recycle, and they can't. There aren't recycling programs there. How about we start there with the basic concept of being able to recycle and bringing forward what, what, how we all want to work to be able to, to eliminate our carbon footprint. We're all thinking about it, but we're not asking everyone the questions, and that's a problem. My work is, is to work and bring with assess accessibility. That's huge. We need to make sure that accessibility is an issue. We want to be able to walk and bike and, and, and do that throughout the city. Thank but you're you. right. People with ADA needs and strollers, that's not always possible. We have to keep that constantly in the dialogue and how we can work with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again to the organizers for this. This is really great. Um, some fantastic answers from everybody. Um, to the, the translators here, um, raise your hand if you translated for anybody today. 
Nobody. This is one of my biggest frustration points at the city council. We sit there night after night after night after night, and we, we debate issues, and we talk about ideas and legislation, and we have public hearings, and we get emails, and we get emails, and we get emails, and look around this room. This is the people that we hear from. Now, you all have a specific focus on a very important issue, and it's incredibly valuable to us to hear that. But generally speaking, overall, we hear from such a small percentage of the population of this 85,000 or whatever we're up to in now city. It's, to step to your question, it is critically important that we are willing to make decisions, to stick to our guns, to vote the way that we ran in our campaigns, to not change positions that we had for years because we got 60 emails or 100 emails from people. 10,000 people in the city voted for Donald Trump. And when we hear from people, Thank you. we can't back away from our values based on the small percentage of people that, that decide to speak up for whatever that issue might be. If it's inconsistent with what we've said we were going to do, if it's inconsistent with what we know is right, we have to be brave enough to stick to our guns and to take those thank actions. You. Thank you, Councilor Davis. Mr. Connolly? Uh, thank you. You know, in, in just less than 50 years, 50 years ago, people were laughing at any of us who grew up here in Somerville. We were made fun of because of where we lived. People couldn't get out of town fast enough when they got out of high school because it wasn't a desirable place to be. It was wise guys and winos who were basically the story in Somerville. Well, a lot of us, many of the people that are in this room have spent the last couple of generations working to improve the quality of life by letting everybody know of what the city has. And it's letting everybody know whether you're a senior or you're a first grade student that there are opportunities here in Somerville. And you know what? With 4.2 square miles and 85,000 people, it's not always easy to communicate. But the important thing is we as leaders in the community have a responsibility to do that. And that's basically what I think a lot of us have tried to do over the years. I know it's something I have done bringing the red, orange, and green line together, working with dozens and dozens of people, Thank you. we've made an impact. Thank you. Thank you. I think I already responded to the first part of the question when I answered Ben's question. The second thing to keep in mind is this, and early on, I see Rep Provo was here, so we were advocates for the green line, and one of the arguments was for economic justice, to bring rapid transit to folks in the poorer parts the, you know, of our community, and if you think about it, the Green Line is perhaps, if we don't do something, the most economic injustice act because it's leading to tremendous gentrification in the city already. And think about what happens when all of those Green Line stops are open and you're going to have a lot of folks with a lot of money who are going to want to live in Somerville and they're going to want to rent properties. So working class folks will be totally priced out. Seniors won't be able to afford to live here. So we have to take that into account. And as we try to put in policy so that there's less people driving in the city, we have to think about the low-income folks who are here who may not be on a rapid transit line where they go to work. I know a lot of folks who work like as house cleaning and stuff, um, you know, sh relatively low income. They work 12, 14 hours a day doing it. They need a car. There's no rapid transit that they can take. So Thank whatever you. we do, we have to be equitable. Thank you so much. President Ballantyne. Thank you. So on the equity issue, um, we have a project in my ward. Um, it is to rebuild 216 public housing units. Um, climate change affects them. Uh, we haven't had actually any new buildings in that section of the city probably for, well, certainly 30 years, maybe even 40 or 50 years. Okay, so every time there's rain, it seeps in through their roofs, in between the bricks, and they have a lot of mold there. Um, that is a project right now that you could let all your counselors know to support, because not all of them supported it last time round. And so now it's up before us again to try to support that project going forward. That is equity for all. Then sort of this vision piece is um, I created with 
One of you, all of you who have always been my in-house consultants, the Green New Deal. And so what is this sort of vision to, to go forward? It's nine pages. It's on the city's website. If you want to call me through Minitrack, you can, I can let you know where it is. But some Thank of the, the things in terms of, of equity. Uh, facilitate more transit-orient development uh, and at least 25% of such developments affordable to those at 30 to 60% of the area median income. Create mm -hmm. comprehensive bus lanes and dedicated bus lanes. Increase housing density as a means to meet current unmet demand for affordable housing. Prioritize low-income housing, especially for people earning less than 30%. You know, there's there's like 50 items there. There is a vision there. So um, please uh, look for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we just have a round of applause for all of our incredible candidates? Thank you. All right. Thank you for your time. We're going to transition into having our mayoral candidates come up here and answer a couple questions. Thank you all.